Um, so back to tonight's presentation, I'd, I'd like to introduce our two featured guests and, and really kind of celebrities in their respective fields here today to talk about their trials. So um, to start, we have Dr. David Palma. He's a radiation oncologist and professor at the London Health Sciences Center and Western University. Um, clinician scientist at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research and chair of the Canadian Pulmonary Radiotherapy Investigators Group. Um, for all of our radiation oncologists in the audience, you uh, may know him um, also as a lead investigator of the Saber Comet trial. Um, also runner and, and um, dad to three kiddos, if I remember right. And um, then we have Dr. Anthony Nichols, um, Associate Professor of the Department of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery and Department of Oncology um, at Western University, um, Director of the Translational Head and Neck Cancer Research Program. Um, and then he also established the first tourist program in Canada. And if I remember right, also dad to three kids. Is that right, Anthony? <laughs> so, um, only two that I know of, yes. Two, okay, okay, great. Um, so, um, so this trial was quite trial is quite notable in that Dr. Nichols and Dr. Palma were able to compare surgery versus radiation for our head and neck patients. However, I understand that they're actually quite good friends and not um, um, brutal enemies or anything like that, which is good because they really helped provide us with a lot of information to help guide our patients in this common scenario. Um, and so tonight is meant to be kind of a fun discussion um, uh, between the two of them, and I'll jump in occasionally with some questions here. So here's a picture of them getting along nicely. So um, these are their disclosures. Um, and um, just to start to kind of set the background, um, this is a, a, a previous gray zone article in the Red Journal um, by Dr. Su Yam, who I believe is in the audience as well, and um, just kind of presented an early stage um, oropharyngeal cancer and um, whether or not oropharyngeal cancer should be managed with primary surgery or primary radiation is arguably one of the most contentious issues in head and neck cancer. So. Um, you can see here that the experts, when they weighed in with their recommended um, treatments, they were really all across the board, everywhere from radiation alone to um, uh, um, towards a neck dissection or, or chemo radiation. So really you can see the need um, for a trial such as this. Um, so um, there have been no prior successfully completed randomized trials um, comparing primary surgery to primary radiation for oropharyngeal cancer. Um, so moreover, um, two prior systematic reviews by Dr. Palma and Dr. Nichols suggested um, that there may be some bias to these, these um, comparisons, specifically um, in the surgical case series that tended to be earlier TNM stages of, the, of those patients. Um, and then some of the earlier, um, some of the comparisons also included non-IMRT cohorts, which obviously would um, impact that data. Um, so uh, last summer, Dr. Nichols and Dr. Palmer reported the orator trial in the Lancet Oncology, um, which was the first randomized controlled trial comparing TORS to primary radiation for oropharyngeal cancer. So I'll hand the rest of the presentation over to them, but um, again, may jump in occasionally with a few questions here. So. Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. We were worried that the handovers would mess everything up, so I'm hoping that you're seeing my screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so hello everybody, thanks for joining us. It'd be better to do this in person. Um, and we're happy to provide some distraction tonight for the other things going on in the world. The way we're gonna do this talk is Anthony and I are gonna jump back and forth a couple of times during the talk. And then at the very end, I'm gonna try to end with some somewhat controversial reflections on radiation. And I know that Dr. Yom is on the call and some things that I think uh, might uh, be of interest to her and, uh, and uh, it'd be interested to, hear, interested to hear her opinion at the end as well. So this is the schema of Orator, and the way that Orator really started was in our disease site team, our, our multidisciplinary tumor board, where once TORS was introduced at our center, every MDT became the same question over and over. What do we do? Do we use radiation? Do we use surgery? And there was this ongoing argument by the radiation oncologist that, well, radiation is what we've always done in Canada. And the surgeons were saying, well, everyone in the U.S. is getting tours. And then we just had this conversation over and over and over again and again every week. And after a while, we sort of got tired of it. And Anthony and I were, were new investigators at the time. And we uh, decided, well, why not just do a trial? 
mostly to stop all of this bickering. And so we designed Orator, and this is the schema for it. Patients had to have an early T-stage squamous cell carcinoma of the oropharynx, and they had to meet with some pretty standard inclusion criteria. And we randomized them in a one-to-one -one ratio between a basically primary radiation approach with concurrent chemo as necessary versus ARM2, which was TORS up front, followed by, including an ectosection, um, and then followed by adjuvant treatment based on pathological findings. And patients were followed up uh, for quality of life and survival. Now, one thing we did in this trial is that we knew at the beginning that if we just offered this trial and offered both treatments off trial, <coughs> this was not going to work. And I'd had some experience when I was um, in Amsterdam working with Suresh Sen and with the Roselle trial, where they were try trying to compare Sabre versus surgery for lung cancer, both available off trial, enrollment was pretty poor because everybody could uh, could just choose. And previously there was a prostate trial in Canada looking at brachytherapy versus surgery and it was the same thing. So we knew that in order for this trial to succeed, we had to only offer TORS on study, just like you would for any other new intervention in medicine, just like you should. These trials are very hard emotionally because patients only go on trial if they want the intervention. If they don't want TORS, then they don't go on trial. They just take the standard arm. So what happens is you get this one-to-one -one randomization between the treatment you really want and the reason you entered the trial versus disappointment. And we had a lot of difficulty around having that conversation with patients when they randomized to arm one. I felt like nobody wanted to hear my voice on the phone when I was calling to tell them which arm they were in. Um, and we, we did have patients, we had a small number of patients drop out, one of whom even went to the U.S. to pay for tours. So it is something to think about as a specialty when we're doing these trials in radiation oncology or if they're surgical trials or if we're comparing the two, how do we do this in a way that's going to answer a scientific question? And at first we were worried, you know, are we withholding an important treatment that's available widely in the U.S.? Is that really the right thing to do? A little bit of self-doubt is, uh, is okay. So the, the primary endpoint was quality of life, one year post-treatment using the MD Anderson dysphagia inventory, which many of you will be familiar with. And then the secondary endpoints were overall in progression-free survival, quality of life at other time points using the uh, scales you can see here, CTCAE toxicity, and feeding tube rate at one year. In the radiation arm, if you had a T1 or T2 tumor and it was N0, then you had radiation alone 70 gray. And you could give that as an excel in an accelerated fashion if you wished. Mostly that's used for people under 70 based on the data from the meta-analyses. And then for people with node positive disease, we would give chemo radiation, high dose of platinum if they could tolerate it. If not, then that could be given as something else like weekly or carboplatinum. In the surgical arm, the surgical details are shown here. They had transoral robotic resection of the primary site with the neck dissection that you can see here and ipsilateral external carotid artery ligation. One thing about this trial that I really enjoyed is that I really learned a lot about TORS and working with Anthony over the years and um, tolerated if it not really understood my it changed my understanding of how surgeons operate in general things around dissecting level 2b and how does that affect the lymph node harvest how does that affect function post-surgery something I didn't really know much about so I, I, there's a lot that we can learn from our colleagues and then a tracheostomy for airway protection um, was at the discretion of the surgeon and we're going to talk a little bit later about a bleeding death and after that bleeding death, the tracheostomy was uh, very strongly recommended. So after surgery, um, the indications here, the first list is, is the list of indications for radiation, close margins, any positive nodes, LVI or T3, T4 disease. And we'll talk a little bit later how this might be a bit aggressive for N1 disease. And then chemo radiation for the uh, indications here. And as a bit of a foreshadowing for the end of the talk, I'm going to come back to this issue and really question why are we doing this in oncology? Something to think about other than what else is going on in politics these days. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony. So we're going to try, I'm going to stop the slide share and, uh, and then Anthony's going to start sharing if that works. And if that doesn't work, Anthony, I'll just uh, continue on. And you're still, you, Tony, you're still muted too. Yep. Can everyone see the results being? Great. Yep. Yeah, so now for the results. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, so between August 2012 and June 2017, 68 patients were randomized at uh, seven centers in Canada and Australia. And uh, here are our uh, demographic features. Here, you can see that our average age was 58. 
Um, the vast majority of patients were PCC positive, so 60 out of the 68, which were perfectly balanced between the two arms, with 30 out of the 34 in each arms. Majority of patients were male as expected, with a mixture of current, previous, and uh, non-smokers. Um, so in terms of uh, the primary sites, uh, the majority of patients were tonsil, 76, uh, 74% with 26% being base of tongue, 44% um, were T1, 56% were T2, and these were well balanced between the arms, as was uh, nodal disease was well balanced between the arms. We uh, note that there was two patients that dropped out after randomization that David alluded to, uh, both of which cited a strong desire for tours, one of which uh, had significant means and went to uh, the United States. Uh, the other patient had radiation off study. Um, and you can see the breakdown for the remaining patients with 28% of patients receiving RT alone in the RT arm and 72% receiving chemo radiation. In the TORS arm, you can see the patient, 10 patients received surgery alone, 16 surgery plus radiation, and eight surgery plus chemo radiation. And here's our uh, primary endpoint, so which was uh, the MD-ADI score at one year. Um, in the RT arm, it was 86.4, and the TORS arm was 80.1, with a p-value of 0 0.04. Um, and you can see that this trend held up with time, and because there's so many more data points, the statistics are actually much more robust, and you can see the p-value is less than 0 0.001. And this uh, higher MD-ADI score uh, extended out to three years. Of course, the numbers drop off over time. And we are going to report our three- and five-year follow-up numbers. We're actually analyzing our three-year follow-up uh, data as we speak. So um, what's of interest to many people, and especially surgeons ask me, well, is this due to adjuvant therapy? And, what, sorry, let me go back here. And you can see that there is no, you know, so this was a post hoc analysis, so this has to be taken with a grain of salt, but there's no difference with the MD-ADI scores between the patients that received RT and CRT, even though you see that the standard deviation is bigger for the CRT. And there was no difference in the MD-ADI scores between patients that received surgery alone, surgery plus radiation, surgery plus chemo radiation. And you know, an interesting point to note is, uh, well, there has been criticism of us using adjuvant therapy for N1 neck disease after surgery, that the patients received TORS alone, their median scores were even a bit lower than the patients that received chemo radiation, um, which argues against that really being the defining feature that made the difference between these two arms. Um, so we did several other post hoc analysis um, that we found interesting that again need to be taken with a grain of salt because we weren't powered for these. Um, but when we looked at lesions of the tonsillar fossa, um, the MD-ADI scores were not significant, uh, they weren't significantly different at one year or over time. And when we looked at the base of tongue, this is actually where we saw the majority of the difference. We do know that by random chance that the surgery patients just happen to have seemingly lower scores at baseline in the um, base of tongue group. When we looked at T1 stage, uh, there was no statistically significant difference between the radiation and primary surgery arm, but, um, or for clinical T2 stage, there's also no difference. When we looked at patients with N0 disease clinically at baseline, there was no difference. But interestingly, when we looked at the nodal positive patients, uh, we saw a statistically significant difference that seemed to hold up over time. Uh, in addition to the MD Anderson dysphagia inventory, we also looked at the functional oral intake score as well as D2 dependency. And uh, other patients that were available for follow up and completed uh, their FOIS scores at one year, you can see that 100% of patients uh, that received RT or CRT were eating a total oral diet with no restrictions, while 16% of the patients that underwent primary surgery need, uh, needed special food preparation or multiple consistencies. This bordered on a statistical significance with a p value of 0.055. We note that um, uh, one patient in the chemo radiation arm had a gastrostomy tube at one year, but interestingly, they had a normal FOIS score and weren't using the tube at all and had it subsequently removed three months later. No patients in the transoral robotic surgery arm had a gastrostomy tube at one year. So in summary, um, there are several features of our quality of life metrics that favored RT. Um, there was a, at least a trend or a statistical significance favoring 
uh, swallowing, uh, improved swallowing in the RT arm by both the, by either the MDADI or Forescore. There was also less pain in pain medication use. That was actually a little bit surprising to me. Um, there was no bleeding episodes. There was less trismus and a trend towards less shoulder impairment. In the surgery arm, there was less tinnitus and hearing loss, neutropenia, and less constipation. So. When we looked at survival, there's no difference in overall or progression-free survival by treatment arm. And as expected, uh, p positive patients did extremely well, while the p negative patients, even though these were very early T-stage disease, did poorly, with the vast majority to succumbing to disease. For the p group, our overall survival was 92% at uh, five years in both arms. When we stratify this out, you can see that the overall survival was uh, exactly the same out to five years, and progression-free survivor was not statistically significant in the P16 positive group. And again, there's only eight patients in the P16 negative group, so those results need to be, again, taken with a grain of salt. So discussion. So the strength of our study is it's the first randomized trial for oropharyngeal cancer comparing surgery to radiation. So it's really the first level one evidence on this topic. Um, and while our sample size is modest, it's actually somewhat large compared to the major majority of randomized trials in the literature that compare surgery and radiation, of which there is many, uh, very few. And the majority of these studies that have been opened do not successfully accrue. Of course, the limited sample size uh, may uh, impact believability for some readers. However, we were adequately powerful for our, our primary endpoint. And indeed, we identified a statistically significant difference in MDADI scores between the two arm, although it arguably didn't, it, but it did not meet our threshold of 10 points to qualify as a clinically meaningful change. So what are our, poten our additional potential limitations? Um, so uh, a fair criticism is the indications for multimodality therapy in both arms. We added uh, for N1 neck disease specifically, we added chemotherapy to radiation therapy. And for patients with um, AJCC7, and one neck disease, which would just be a single node of less than three centimeters, we added adjuvant radiation. So when we planned this trial back in 2012, um, this was uh, quite debatable. Um, you know, in the mock NCE meta-analysis for stage three oropharyngeal cancer, there was a survival benefit, although perhaps not teased out for the exact population that we were looking at. And there is some population-based data um, such as this one uh, shown on the right here, generated from the National Cancer Database that suggests that postoperative radiation uh, for N1 neck disease in both oral cancer and oropharyngeal cancer is beneficial. However, the, um, after the publication of this trial and discussion with many other centers, it would seem that the majority of centers uh, wouldn't intensify for a single node uh, over three centimeters. Additional potential limitation is surgical expertise. Um, so certainly there's some incredibly high volume surgeons in the United States like Dr. Weinstein and, and others that really develop TORS. And certainly there's no doubt that our Canadian and Australian surgeons uh, did not have that vast breadth of experience. However, it is important to know that all of our surgeons were fellowship trained, largely in the US um, and uh, many of which with high volume TORS surgeons that trained them. Um, however, we wanna look at this objectively. Were we inferior surgeons? And what's helpful is that recently there's been the ECOG 3311 trial led by Dr. Ferris. And the, um, while the main publication is not out, the surgical credentialing paper is out and it gives some insight into these details. So, you know, we did have um, four bleeds out of our 34 patients, um, one of which was a fatal bleed, which is a terrible thing, um, especially for a P60 positive patient that's highly curable. Um, but we compared that. So, um, the, in the ECOG study, the grade three to five free rate was 30 out of 495, and so 6%. And uh, that was basically identical to our grade three to five bleed rate of 5.8%. So we looked at margins. And so in the ECOG 3311 trial, there was a stunningly low rate of positive margins, which perhaps is expected of this group of highly credentialed surgeons. And so there's positive margins only 19 out of 495 cases. And we had positive margins in four out of 34. And so this bordered on statistical significance, which is, which is fair. But we do know that how do we compare to the average US center and the typical person carrying out tours? So 
my colleague uh, Tony Eskander and a resident of Ohio State, Kevin Zan, looked at the National Cancer Database. They, this was published in Cancer last year, and they looked at positive. They looked at many quality indicators, including positive margins, and some interesting things came up. So, the average U.S. center that treats oropharyngeal cancer that was um, in the top 25th percentile of volume, that threshold was just 23. So there's actually quite a few small centers that are even smaller than 23 oropharyngeal cancer patients a year um, managing patients. And that's not implying that all of those are surgical, only a subset are surgical. And so even in that top 25th percentile, uh, the positive margin rate was 16.3%. And so I really think that our surgeons that had a 12% bleeding rate is quite compa- contemporary and, may, and even in the upper end of uh, quality indicators compared to the U.S. as a whole. And it also maybe harkens that, you know, when we, if we look at just these very highly group, uh, qualified, highly credentialed surgeons, maybe that isn't broadly applicable to, you know, care across the night as a whole, because really it's a very small subset of people that are delivering that level of care and certainly the low positive margin rate. So we think that our studies, our, our findings are translatable from that perspective. And uh, so we also wanted to look at how do our results look compared to others. So we just uh, we're just uh, have this paper under revision uh, right now at a journal, but we did a systematic review looking at swallowing outcomes uh, after transrobotic surgery, specifically for T1 and T2 cancers. And the majority of scores were actually significantly lower, down to 66. There was one study by um, Mercanti and colleagues that was 86.1. But when we looked at our uh, our meta-analysis, uh, the the mean was 71.84, meaning that our, our results were really quite favorable. And again, probably extrapolatable, uh, have external validity outside of uh, our study alone. So one of the more controversial uh, perspectives from uh, the surgical um, the surgical perspective is tracheostomy. So uh, tracheostomies aren't sexy. I didn't do them. Um, it makes tour sound much less interesting. Patients don't like the sound of it. Um, and um, however, you know, I'm pretty open that we, this bleeding death that we had as our center. And in full disclosure, I would say that this, it was the worst surgical complication that I've had. And I try to be an advocate for safety because, you know, we, we've, I've looked at our mortality, um, after major head and neck surgery, we have so many elderly patients to get free flaps, these huge operations for 10 hours. And our perioperative mortality at our center is less than 1% with excellent anesthesia and perioperative care with all these elderly patients. And so for a uh, this patient that was a T, T2N0 HV positive cancer, you know, that would have gotten radiation alone, his risk of death would very likely be zero if we extrapolate from H2 and, and other studies. And so I think it really is a disaster. And looking at this closely and talking to other colleagues, this is something that I think is really underreported and um, something to think about. And so and what, de- deconstructing this complication and talking to colleagues elsewhere at many named institutions. Um, and again, I trained in the States and talked to my mentors in Boston. This has happened to the vast majority of high volume tour surgeons. And it really seems to be aspiration rather than exsanguination. And so I feel strongly about putting a temporary tracheostomy. It for sure slows people down in hospital. They swallow slower in hospital. But the trachea, and I actually downsize them and leave a small trachea in for 14 days so that their airway can be accessed, uh, sorry, accessed and suctioned and put asleep if they do have a bleed. And um, I can't really fathom how that would hurt their swallowing at one year. I've talked to some world experts, including Kate Hutchinson at MD Anderson, and she agrees. But surgeons are stuck on that. And when we retrospectively, again, this wasn't randomized, right? Because this is kind of pre and post this event. And it was almost half of our, almost exactly half of our surgical population. And there was no statistical difference in swallowing. And so I, I don't I don't think that that made the big difference. Another controversy is bilateral neck treatment. So one of the criticisms that I've heard from the surgical community is that for base of tongue, we did bilateral neck dissections. And, um, you know, I think that, that this is a, that's an interesting point for further study. Um, but just yesterday, my colleague, Dr. John Del Media presented this trial concept to the NRG that's already going forth to um, both, with both the EORTC and within our Canadian clinical trials group of using 
spec CT to guide treatment. I'm going to talk about that more on the next page. But when he queried surgery, surgical oncologists, and, and head and neck radiation oncologists, the vast majority of cases that had base of tongue extension with a tonsil cancer, you can see that 94% of radiation oncologists would treat the neck bilaterally um, with more than one centimeter of tongue uh, invasion. Or if it came close to the mid within one centimeter of midline, all the radiation oncologists would treat bilaterally. And so these patients are getting bilateral neck radiation. So when they looked at the surgeons, it was a much smaller rate. It was about uh, 30 or 40 percent um, just doing ipsilateral neck dissections. But what it seemed from the results is that almost all those patients were getting postoperative radiation to the contralateral neck. And so whether it's the right thing to do or not, I think is very much up for discussion, particularly with base of tongue cancers, which many surgeons will point to. Uh, it, it really seemed from the radiation oncology world that there was the vast majority of people are treating bilaterally. And so that's led to this motivation for this SPEC CT study, um, which I'll, I'll gloss over the details of that just for the interest of time. Um, so what are our next steps? So one of the things is comparing long-term outcomes. So many surgeons have uh, asked me that they see these patients that have late toxicity, that have late decline in swallowing function and a D2 dependent after chemo radiation. You know, I've asked them about, you know, maybe they're biased. Were these patients from 10 years ago, 15 years ago that were in the pre-IMRT era? In my experience, they are. The most of the patients that I, I've seen that have had those complications. Um, but uh, certainly that's a fair comment. And so we're going to compare our three-year and five-year outcomes. As I mentioned previously, we're actually actively analyzing our three-year data, which may lead to different conclusions, just like what we saw with RTOG 9111. Um, and more so, we're trying to do better and uh, I would say correct and address some of the shortcomings and controversial things that came up in the first trial. And so this has um, led to the development of Order 2. So Order 2 is HIV positive only, um, T1 to T2, N0 to N2 in the ACCC 8th edition. We're randomizing and we're stratifying by smoking status. So uh, that's an important distinction from H2. It's both smokers and non-smokers. However, our primary radiation arm is the chemo radiation arm taken from H2, uh, Dr. Yom's trial almost exactly with 60 gray with weekly cisplatin if uh, multiple nodes or a single lymph node greater than three centimeters for surgical treatment for salvage of persistent disease. And then arm two is uh, built upon the ECOG 3311 strata, but even further de-intensified. Um, so patients get transoral surgery and neck dissection with adjuvant uh, radiation 50 to 60 grade based on risk factors, but no chemotherapy under any circumstances, um, even if there's a positive margin or extracapsular extension, unless gross disease is left behind. And so what's nice about this site is that the, you know, the first trial was uh, just six centers, not seven, I misspoke earlier, but a greatly expanded number of centers and while we limited the first trial to just transoral uh, robotic surgery, we're also doing uh, integrated transoral laser surgery and uh, at numerous sites in Canada and Australia. And actually we've just activated at our first, uh, sorry, are going to activate shortly at our first US site. So the University of West Virginia is going to open the trial shortly. Um, and so uh, it's great to have some American representation as well. Um, lastly, um, you know, this as a, you know, HIV negative disease is just as interesting. So there are some retrospective studies that suggest that the primary surgical approach can offer superior survival for HIV negative disease. And so this has been taken on by my colleague, Dr. McNeil, as well as uh, David as well, who's the co-PI, where basically it's the same exact schema as the first trial, um, but HIV negative. And um, we re haven't put any limitations on neck disease, though. So in the first trial, we had to be no extra caps were spread and less than four centimeters. And this, this trial, as long as it's resectable, um, the patients are eligible for the trials, as long as they have early T1 or T2 stage. And so this uh, was open this year and is actively accruing. Um, I'll pass it back to David. I'm just going to close with some few sort of introspective thoughts about radiation and how we can improve where we go. Brian Kavanaugh asked on the chat about, if we could expand a bit about some of the difficulties in randomizing patients between these two, these two very different modalities. 
And one thing that we've always tried to do in any of our trials is to really envision the pitch to the patient in the exam room and how you're going to relate the trial in a way that is fair, understandable, and will make them enthusiastic. But obviously not overselling a trial. As we know, most trials are, are negative. What we've done for Orator 2 is we've actually made a video, a consent video, which if you're bored and you can't get to sleep tonight, if you go to orator2.com, you can see two somewhat nerdy oncologists that look a bit like me and Anthony <laughs> giving a bit of a description of the trial. And what we do in the clinic is we, we say to the patient, hey, we're going to give them a bit of introduction to their diagnosis, and then we, we give them the video, we step out, and they go through the video and we come back in. But it, it, re it really is a challenge, and it's the same challenge um, – with many radiation trials, when like with Comet and Comet 3, Comet 10, that every patient who goes on the trial wants the experimental arm, and if it's not available off trial, then they'll be they'll, they'll be very disappointed. What we what I've started doing in my consultations, especially for the Comet trials, is before randomization, I have a very frank talk with them about if they're randomized to the standard arm, and I found that that has really changed everybody's perception of the randomization. I tell them this is what's going to happen in the standard arm, this is what you would get at every other center. And I use the example of the, a trial that all the radiation oncologists will know, RTOG0617, where we were looking at lung cancer doses, a medium dose versus a high dose, and everyone assumed the high dose was going to be better, but it's actually worse once the trial was, was done with more deaths. So I, I, I impress upon them that the standard arm might be better, trying to sort of temper that enthusiasm. And it, it's something that, that I don't think is ever easy, and I never enjoy making those phone calls, but I think it's something that needs to be done. If, if we hadn't done Orator, you know, my main conclusion from Orator is the toxicities are different. That's the main conclusion. I don't see it as a winner, but the toxicities are different, and, and the outcomes are pretty similar in terms of oncologic control. But if we hadn't done it, then we would probably be under the assumption that TORS is, is better. So... Doing these trials is, is, is critical, and if we hadn't, if, you know, we haven't harmed anybody by putting them on the standard arm in, in orator. So I'm going to close with a few thoughts, some uh, introspection um, in terms of our own specialty, radiation, how we can improve things. There's a lot of room to improve, and I want to bring up three issues that really over the past five years I've really struggled with. One is that I, I think chemo is really given too indiscriminately especially in the post-operative situation. So the strength of the indications for port, margin positive and ECE positive, to put it lightly, is, is very, very weak. And, and it sort of came from this paper where they took these two RCTs, they found some common inclusion criteria, and they examined those patients. So that would be like if we have orator and another trial, let's say there's a European orator, and we decide, hey, look, we both have these three inclusion criteria in common. Let's do a subgroup analysis. And then we find that in that subgroup analysis, OS is better with, say, TORS, then we all adopt TORS around the world. That would not fly at all in today's, in today's landscape of evidence-based medicine. But that's exactly what happened. And this is a criticism of that by Dr. Sinha and, and colleagues published in Cancer. And what they say, uh, they didn't put it in red that I did in the middle there, but what they say is that the less than high level evidence upon which the NCCN guideline for the use of adjuvant CRT is based, is based mandates a thorough reevaluation, especially in the context of HPV slash P16 positive oropharynx epidemic. So, so really we need to, to challenge that view that really our, our, our whole specialty, and especially medical oncologists, on, oncology has adopted this treatment, which is quite toxic for a large proportion of patients based on an unplanned analysis, which any level of evidence will tell you is hypothesis generating. So that hypothesis should be really tested in an RCT. But that brings us to the idea of escalation versus de-escalation. And people have talked a lot about for what endpoint do we de-escalate in the HPV positive population? And what, what endpoint do we need to escalate? But I want to remind everyone that it, as general principle, in head and neck radiation oncology has been that we escalate with chemo for an OS benefit. So we escalate when there's an OS benefit. So that's in the mock nc meta-analysis. Everybody talks about the OS benefit of chemotherapy. No one talks about the PFS benefit. And, and PORT, although I've told you that data is weak, we're escalating in the patients who there is a purported OS benefit. So we escalate for an OS benefit. And Dr. Yam is on, on, the, uh, on the call, and Dr. Yam and I are very good friends. But 
What's happening in HIV positive disease is that we're escalating for PFS, right? If you look at Dr. Young's trial, which is certainly a paradigm changer in our specialty, the two-year OS was the same in the two arms. And we know that in the trial, these two arms are not compared. So if, you're, if you escalate with chemo for OS, then we should be choosing the RT alone arm to move forward. But we're actually choosing the chemo RT arm to move forward for a PFS benefit. So we've decided that contrary to all of our other paradigm, paradigms in head and neck cancer, we're actually going to escalate for PFS, not OS. But then even that PFS benefit is weak. Again, this is not, compared, not a comparative trial, but the difference in PFS, if you were to look at the two arms comparatively, which I'm supposed to do, was only 3%, right? So you need to treat 33 patients with concurrent chemo radiation to prevent one progression event, many of which will be salvageable by surgery. So 32 people are getting chemo probably for nothing, if not 33. And we all know the attendant toxicities of chemo, let, let alone the question of low dose versus high dose. So a few other things to think about for radiation. And the last thing I want to say is our targets and doses need a bit of work. We need to define our doses and radiation volumes with head-to-head -head randomized comparisons. What we have is we have so much heterogeneity across the world in clinical practice. So if you go to one center versus another or one oncologist versus another, you might get a completely different treatment. And this is a pivotal paper, a paper by Dr. Harari that came out in the Green Journal a few years ago. And my title of this slide is somewhat tongue-in-cheek. They sent this tonsillar plan with a bit of basic tongue extension to 20 different centers. Here are nine of the different centers in terms of their volumes. And you can see at one center, you're going to get just a GTV here and another CTV behind it, right? At, at, whereas at other centers, you're getting all kinds of different volume sizes, uh, laterality treated. It's all over the place. And, and this is stuff that should be pretty easily answerable in, in our CTs. Not only are the volumes heterogeneous, but the dosing, this table you cannot see, but you don't really need to read the details. The dosing is all over the place. So we struggled a lot with Orator and Orator 2 in developing a protocol that people were happy with because everybody says, well, at my center, we do it this way. At my center, we do it that way. We treat these nodes. We don't treat these nodes. We use this dose. It makes it very, very difficult to move forward if things are standardized. Whenever we come up with contouring atlases in radiation oncology, we say, you know, maybe the contouring atlas itself won't improve outcomes. It might, but at least it gives us a starting point because it makes us all homogenous. And once we're homogenous, we can then test different deviations from the standard. But in head and neck, we're kind of stuck. So I wanted to leave things on a very thoughtful and provocative note. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed uh, joining us today. And we also wanted to leave time for questions. So we have about 20 minutes and we'd be happy to discuss. I noticed that many of you on the call are radiation oncologists, and I would really urge you to ask Anthony any questions about surgery that, that you have, because really the best part of this trial uh, for me was not only getting to go to Dr. Nichols' wedding in uh, Lake Como <laughs> when it was all done, but I really learned a lot about, about surgery, and it, I feel like it's made me a better radiation oncologist. So with that, we'll close, and I'll stop sharing, and then um, I'll turn it back over to Kaylee. Thanks so much to both of you for your insight. That was really, uh, really good. So um, I know there's a lot of people that have some really good questions here. So I want to make sure we get to those as much as we can. But um, did just kind of want to ask um, both both you and Dr. Nichols um, kind of briefly after doing this trial, how would you counsel a patient about TORS versus radiation? Um, you know, off trial, um, just a, a patient that comes into your clinic. What would you tell them? Um, sure. Like, so, you know, so we, because we made an effort to transition straight to our next trial, and it's a nice feature that not every center in Canada, but most centers in Canada have come with us and are only offered on study. Um, the, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh uh, gave, gave us a question about the challenge of randomization. So, you know, so all hats off to David, who had the experience in the Netherlands of, with lung cancer, that if you give people option to choose, they'll just choose. And, you know, we really did feel good that 
in our center, in the vast majority of centers in Canada, there are some subsets like Dalhousie, the University of Alberta, uh, that were doing transoral surgery, whether it was open or laser surgery for years. But our center, prior to 2010, when patients came into our center, they would be offered radiation, right? There wasn't a discussion. It's just like if someone came into your institution with a T1 nasopharyngeal cancer, surgery might be an option, right? But you don't talk about it. You go straight to your standard there, whereas somewhere in Asia and some centers might offer that, you just talk about your standard therapy. And it really wasn't discussion, orphanage cancer, you know, when we were at multidisciplinary clinic, the surgeon's eyes would glaze over and say, here, you know, talk to our radiation oncologist and you would excuse yourself out of the room while they had their detailed talk about it. And, you know, the findings of the trial, uh, I agree with David. So, you know, I think that both are still are reasonable options. I don't say think that this definitely means you can't do surgery. The survival is excellent. You know, there was no G tube dependencies in either arm. Um, both, you know, both the quality of life was metrics were different. But uh, and so I think it really is informed decision making for both the caregiver and the patient. But given the fact that there was nothing that strongly favored surgery, we only continue to offer it on trial for these patients. We still use TORS for salvage, right? So for local salvage uh, for things that need primary surgery, like minor salivary gland cancers um, and unknown primary workup. We still do lots of robotic surgery for those things. Um, so we have a detailed discussion and we actually have a, a video that we've made. You can see order2.com. <laughs> and it's actually helpful, not just for us, but for our, um, our participating centers where it's about 20 minutes and we really walk through the pros and cons and I don't sugarcoat it because, you know, again, I think that the, this bleeding fatality is by far my worst surgical complication in my career, you know, um, and and I tell people about that. And so there's people that decline when they hear about that, they hear about the trait now because, and because if you say, so when we first started it, you know, you know, when we see it, we're going to take this out with a robot and, you know, we can even hook a laser to the robot you can talk anyone it's all about how it's couched and you can talk anyone into this and you know overlooking the fact that you still need an open neck incision right and once you get to those details people are usually a little surprised like oh i thought that was the road with two so it's all about you frame it but the more gray hair i got people got it and in canada where we have you know limitless number of patients i'm very candid and we explicitly talk through the risks of the neck dissection stroke the need for adjuvant therapy and so it's a quite detailed discussion. And I would say even versus the first trial, our recruitment rate is slightly lower, I think, because we're even more candid about that discussion and more detailed as I, we've all learned more and more. Um, but now that we have more centers, we're just doing really well with recruitment and it's going that way. And I think, it's, I, th I think it's really important to realize that people really like the sound of robotic surgery. People like the sound of surgery as it is. Like for my lung cancer practice, those of you who treat anything, everyone wants everything taken out. But we did a decision board um, at the beginning of the trial, just to, for people who weren't on the trial, getting people to talk through um, the different options with an unbiased researcher who had no affiliation to either group. And we first did it on non-medical professionals and, and it was 80 percent tours. They want they would choose tours over RT. And then we did it on people who worked in the cancer center. And I was like, okay, here's here's where this comes. You know, we had like the radiation therapy secretaries doing it. So I thought at least my secretary would choose Radon. And it was 80% TORS again. So I think we need to keep that in mind that, that people really do like that approach. And as Radon and as surgeons, we need to um, inform people of the trade offs between the two. It really speaks to the importance if you can, if you practice in an area where you can have multidisciplinary clinics. It makes all the difference in the world because we keep each other honest. Anthony and I are in the room together. Or, we, you know, we have five head and neck surgeons. We have uh, five head and neck radiation oncologists. We don't all, 10 of us, see the patient at the same time. It's one of each at the time. And and we work with each other, so it keeps it keeps sort of equilibrium across the group. But you have to, you can't coach things in a way that um, that is inaccurate. And, you know, it's really, it, one thing that's changed is that for T1 larynxes, for example, we I have a totally different consent discussion than I did before we did these M MDT clinics. We talk actually a lot about that 10% risk of failure in the T1s and that you need a laryngectomy, right? So we talk about how 
voice is might get a little bit better with radiation, but if you're that one in ten that recur after radiation, you're basically getting laryngectomy. And that sways it. That was a discussion that I only really learned about after years of doing these the, 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 these clinics, and it has changed our practice. So I think these discussions of TORS versus radiation are best done if you can have both in the room. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Yao, I know you had some, some comments, and I know you, I'm sure you have some good thoughts and, and questions here, so I thought I'd see if you wanted to jump in. Oh, let's see. Um, I think, you know, uh, how can I say this? Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Palma. I think, um, I think there's two issues. You know, one is, you know, what he already pointed out, uh, which actually Rush Majakini just published out in the Red Journal. It's a great paper. You should look at it. A therapeutic misconception, which is this idea that um, something new or something that's hard to get that's offered on a trial is inherently better. Um, and, you know, we now know from the gazillion randomized phase three studies that have been failures in head and neck that that's not true. <laughs> you don't have to go long <laughs> to find examples. Um, you just go through the NRG portfolio. And, um, and then we also, you know, the other, the other issue is that, yes, I mean, surgery is very um, appealing. Um, emotionally for patients because there's a lot of sort of ideas about you know oh I get it out of my body because it's this foreign thing and you know um, uh, I mean just so many misconceptions right like oh it's gonna it's gonna stop it from spreading um, of course other patients have this other misconception which is like oh you cut into it and then it spreads it but you know whatever there's there's a lot of stuff like that around surgery that's that's kind of um, difficult to work through just for people's personal experiences. But I, I actually think that, um, as sad as it is to say, a lot of this is decided by economics. Um, and that's just a really complicated and multifaceted thing, which is like, you know, economics of having a TORS machine, economics of running that machine and keeping it solvent um, for your percentage of the machine, um, economics of reimbursement in the United States. Um, economics of radiation reimbursement in the United States and what radiation reimbursement means to cancer centers, you know, to be frank. Um, I mean, we, we brought people back from COVID, let's face it. Radiation oncology saved the American healthcare system from COVID. <laughs> that is a fact, me and radiology. Um, and, you know, um, and the other thing to think about here, as, as they pointed out, is the role of chemotherapy and, and what that does to quality of life on just like multiple dimensions. But I actually think that in the end, a lot of this is going to be decided again by economics, which is when we get bundled payments um, and the APM for all the controversy and, 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 and sheer hatred that is being piled upon it is a step in somewhat of a positive direction, thinking about diagnoses as opposed to procedures. And when that happens, um, there's going to be a reckoning about what is and is not necessary and what is and is not efficient. That will be very different, um, at least in the U.S. So, yeah, I think that's really important, um, Dr. Yaman. And I think, in some ways, it, and by it, the way, don't compare arms in HN zero zero. What? I thought you said. I thought you said. I thought you said at Astro. I thought you said at Astro you can unofficially compare arms. I don't know. Was that off the record? I can't remember. No, I'm just joking. Um, I, I think it does point also to the fact this. You this can compare arms in the lobby. <laughs> Uh, we'll talk, we can tell the backstory about your contact lenses another time. Yeah, it's another discussion for another another VVPN. Um, that was pre-COVID. Yeah. No contact. No contact. <laughs> was COVID. No contact lenses. No, the, I um, protect them all the, the way. <laughs> I'm really serious. The, the economics. I'll work with these <laughs> That's right. The um, the economics are very important, and I think I wanted to say a few words. I don't it's also quite impressive, partly because their bedtimes aren't as late as, or aren't as early as people like me in their 40s. But if you are, a couple of lessons around Terrell design. One is that the, the economics part of it is, is a bit easier in some locations versus others. And, and you know, for, for TORS versus radiation, it didn't really affect much about Anthony or my bottom line or a hospital because there's already a machine. Actually, they didn't want us to use it more than anything. So where you do your trial, um, can Im impact what kind of trial you can do. And so there's some trials that are easier in the U.S., some that are not. But the other thing I wanted to point out is that I'm a big believer in, in small trials for certain questions. 
you know, we can't do the non-inferiority HN5 with 60 patients. But some of these trials around can we reduce the radiation volumes, they could be done with smaller, with smaller groups. And those, are, those trials shouldn't be too costly because you don't have an expensive drug. So I would, I would encourage the residents. You know, Anthony and I have been talking about moving on from the Taurus versus radiation world. And you, you don't do trials until you're 70. So we want to sort of pass along to the next generation who are going to take, a, take over the mantle of running trials in our, in, our, in our specialties that sometimes a small trial can go a long, long way. You don't have to be the head of the NRG head and neck group to, to run a meaningful trial. It certainly helps. But even if you're not, some of these trials can, can have an impact. So well, I, I think, okay, okay, I have to interrupt here. Cause I, yeah, I think, go ahead, Dr. Young. I think there's a real difference in equivalence trials in a disease that has incredibly good outcomes, okay, yeah. um, as opposed to a trial where there's really meaningful, huge differences in outcomes. So, I mean, I would actually encourage the residents not to look at trivial questions, but to look at huge questions, right? Like, if I was the resident, the last thing I would work on is HPV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do yeah, not no. need you. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. And no, and definitely not true for the question. Anaplastic but... thyroid cancer, okay? Can somebody, like, please take an interest in this disease? Or, you know, frankly, HPV negative, right? Because mm -hmm. all you have to do there is run a superiority trial. And yes, you can do that with very small numbers. Yeah, exactly. The only I, I reason agree. you guys got away with it here was because you declared radiation as the standard arm. And you sort of got away with that. In the U.S., we really can't do something like that. It's much yeah, more that, complicated. There's no consensus on the standard arm, quote unquote, right? Um, Dr. Seven Matwani, are you uh, are you there, Seven? I know he had a, a question that he put in the um, chat there. I, I am here. I actually added a second question because I wasn't sure, but um, you know, the questions for both of you in regards to. The questions basically like, what pearls of wisdom did you learn from each other with regards to, so uh, Dr. Palmer, like what did you learn about TORS that you kind of had an underappreciation for and that kind of you think about more now as a radiation oncologist? And then the flip question is for Dr. Nichols is, what did you learn about radiation therapy that you may have underappreciated and now you think about a little bit more in your in your job as a surgeon. That's that's a great question. And you know, it, it's funny. Um, you know, when you get to be staff, you kind of forget about what you knew and didn't know as a resident. And when you get to be a resident, you kind of forget about what you didn't didn't know as a med student. So it's, sometimes it's hard to go back because you internalize things, and then you run like, why doesn't this med student know all the cranial nerves and radiation doses that you didn't know at the time? So it is a bit hard to go back and. And, and put yourself in your shoes from five years ago. But some of the things that come to mind are around um, the around resectability and function. You know, resecting both sides of the base of tongue, not a good idea for the most part, both neurovascular bundles. Um, getting down close to high to the hyoid where might be the positive margin, that's an issue. Um, if somebody has a retropharyngeal carotid, which I hadn't really heard about before, it's, it's a problem because after you do the tours, the carotid is exposed and you would need to put a flap on there. And we use that as an exclusion criterion um, in, a, in our trials. So these are just different things that can exclude people, even being able to open your mouth. And, and the, the, we were worried that people would be randomized and you get them to tours and you can't get the, you can't get the device in there. We actually had a patient on Orator 2 at a different center who was randomized to tours and they couldn't do it. Little things like that, I think, are, are, are important. And I would say the other thing I learned is that TORS makes you sore in the short, in the short term. TORS makes you sore. Even the people who come, um, you know, are PUKs now, they're going for uh, epsilon tonsillectomy and I guess what, for lack of a better term, like a shave of the base of tongue, they're, they're pretty sore for a while. It heals, but um, it, it's like tonsillectomy in kids that get ice cream, but it's, these are adults who are on Tylenol number three. So in, in, a, in, in, a, in the short term, TORS does make you sore. And the last thing I wonder about it is that I think a lot about is to what extent is could our radiation be reduced after TORS? And what's the minimum? This isn't something I've learned, but something I'm really thinking about. You know, TORS is quite effective. How little radiation can we give after? To what extent are we contributing to these long-term effects? That's, that's one thing that I'm, I really think about. Anthony, what did you learn about radiation? 
basically you just got you just have to learn how to draw in circles just draw in circles I'm joking so um, so 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 first of all so tremendous amount right so you know surgical training you know you work here with radiation and call oncology colleagues but it's very superficial you know getting an appreciation for you know avoiding critical structures you know avoiding the constrictors um, and um, just how critical it is and I think I think you know a higher level of appreciation for the expertise involved, and then you know working with David and I were disease site chairs for six or seven years together, and bringing in our lower volume satellite centers, seeing how you know the higher expertise of our high volume center makes a massive difference. Um, but more so, first of all, hats off to David. So I'm I'm not a clinical trialist by training. Uh, this was really mentored by David, and there's other people on this call. I see Alex Louie and Mark. Cork, uh, Corkum and, and others here that's kind of he's created this generation of surge, uh, radiation oncology investigators and so it's been a very interesting voyage um, you know developing my own skill set understanding how these work going through this process of publishing in this high impact journal which is uh, you know new ground for me I'm, I'm mainly a lab guy that uh, you know that, um, and just the incredible rigor that you have to have a priori um, in terms of your protocol to have a chance at publishing in any of these uh, journals and the incredible rigor that you need to have. Uh, you know, hats off to David for having the foresight for all those uh, years ago. And um, so I, I think that's been a really interesting joy, journey. You know, so I've been, I've been accused of being an anti-surgeon, but, you know, one of the things, <laughs> you know, so... Uh, particularly with this trial, so uh, I'm not. Sh it maybe COVID's good because people will forget about it a little bit, so I can start attending surgical meetings again. Um, but all jokes aside, you know there is a there is a lot of surgical bravado and and just strong feelings about what is better, and that my tours is better than your tours, and you know just like the heterogeneity that there is in radiation treatments for sure. There are good and bad surgeons, which can be objectively measured. But you know, I'm, I've been kind of taken aback at how it's to be honest. In the surgical world, like the Canadian and people that didn't do hundreds of them, because again, like I can prove to you, you know, Tony through Tony Askander's paper, and we're further analyzing that that the vast majority of uh, you know U.S. surgeons that are doing pores and transoral surgery aren't high volume. You know, in Canada, all of almost a hundred percent of major head and neck surgery, a hundred basically a hundred percent of the patient, there's no tours in the community, there's no transoral there is community anywhere in our country except for perhaps a small area of BC. All of these patients are referred to tertiary care. We have our challenges for sure, but in terms of cancer care and head and neck cancer care, Virtually 100% of these patients are uh, treated by fellowship trained head and neck surgeons. And so we're not chump change, including myself, right? I trained at Harvard and Boston, not to cite that. And so it's kind of alarming when that card is pulled on me about. Uh, and so that's a little bit, uh, that's, that's taken me back. And, um, but in full disclosure, it's, we've increased the rigor for our credentialing for the second study with requiring more cases. We're auditing cases uh, every five case, surgical cases per center for bleeding and margins, and people can come off study. Um, and so it's been an eye-opening journey. And uh, again, uh, thanks again for David for taking me on this ride, and it's been really interesting. Thanks. Oh, I know we have another question from um, Dr. Maganaki. Dr. Drew Maganaki, do you have a question? I sure do. Uh, thanks so much for hosting. This is incredible <laughs> without having to get on a plane and come to Denver. Uh, hi, David. Hi, Nick. Um, uh, question for you guys uh, is this issue of, you know, quality of life survey instruments and this whole notion of minim minimal, minimum clinically important difference, the MCID. Could you kind of like, for those of us who are interested in clinical trials design, walk us through your personal journey, looking at both in the concept of designing it, whether you had any questions or doubts regarding the, you know, like the variability of response and fidelity of the findings and external generalizability, 
And then also when you're in the trenches doing the analyses, kind of what kind of thoughts and confidence levels that you have looking at those data? Yeah, maybe I'll start with the design part. And then Tony, you can talk about the interpretation. So Drew Moganaki, for those of you who don't know him, is um, one of the leaders in lung cancer research. He leads a big trial at the VA called Valor, which is comparing stereotactic radiation to surgery. It hasn't given any, him any gray hair yet, and it's occurring very well. So hats off for those things. When we designed the trial, we knew we couldn't do an OS trial, and quality of life metrics are very good because they are on a, it's a continuous variable, zero to 100, with standard deviation. Continuous variables lead to much smaller sample sizes than variables that are proportions, like rates of pneumonitis going from 30 to 10. That's always a very, very big sample size. So that is, if you want to do a small trial, quality of life is the way to go. You know, don't do trivial trials, as, as Dr. Yom said, but if there's a quality of life question, that's the way to go. When we designed the trial, we needed to power it for the minimally significant difference, minimally clinically important difference. It's called many different things. And what that concept does, it kind of draws a line in the sand. This difference is important, this is not. And at the time we, we wrote the trial, there was no publication on the clinically meaningful differ, difference. And so what we did is we just did what we, from other quality of life scales, generally if the scale goes from zero to 100, 10 points is a minimally clinically important difference. So we said in a protocol that in a, in a metric like that, a quality of life metric, usually a 10 point difference is clinically important. And that's how we powered it. And this trial started. Then two years later, Kate Hutchison, who's this speech language pathologist researcher extraordinaire, at MD Anderson, she decided to determine what the minimal clinically important difference was, and it was 10. I was like, wow, that's pretty lucky on our part. You have to make some calls when you design a protocol, and there are so many of them that can be second-guessed. But one of the things, again, if you're writing a protocol, what I tell my residents and fellows or whoever's writing a protocol, you make a call and then present these things to your group and you can hash them out. But you gotta make a decision, and, and, and no one knows a priori what the right decision is, when you're writing a trial, and, and, and nobody does later, even with Comet, all histologies, one histology, you know, all this kind of stuff, it gives us stress, but you gotta make a call. So we chose 10, and off, off we went, and then we got this result, and then I'll hand it over to Tony. Yeah, so, you know, so again, um, I think that that was an interesting call, but interestingly, when we were preparing for our presentation at ASCO last year, the same Kate Hutchinson actually messaged, messaged us, and she actually questioned her own number of 10. And so she cited this actually quite old paper from the 90s that was looking at quality of life metrics and how there was consistency of a half standard deviation being a clinically meaningful change. And so she thinks that in retrospect, you know, what they were looking at in her MD Anderson cohort were big differences like G-tube, non-G-tube. But obviously you saw that there was no G-tube dependencies in our study population, and so it's more subtle. And it just so happened that the standard deviation average in both arms was 12, and the difference that we found was 6.7. So she, she actually argued that the difference might be a borderline clinically meaningful change. But again, I think that overall, these patients are doing well, not G-tube dependent, you know, and there are pluses and minuses both, right? For some people, really surgery is largely chemo avoidant, right? So two thirds of our patients didn't need chemo and therefore didn't get the tinnitus and hearing loss, which I'm sensitive to as an otolaryngologist, um, you know, didn't get neutropenia. Um, and, um, and so perhaps that's really important with people. There's a, and so I think that the other thing that I'll state is that, you know, in the HPV space, um, I think that you have to be a little aggressive. So, you know, if you, because these trials take, um, you know, eight to 10 years. And so is the results of your trial going to be that, um, relevant when you're done in this such a rapidly training space where we're integrating immunotherapy, induction therapy, we're dropping radiation doses. The Mayo Clinic is giving 36 gray postoperatively, right? This like homeopathic dose. Oh, and sorry to anyone on mail, but like a very, very low dose. And so um, you have to, and so that's part of the leap in, in our study with the no chemo and the surgical arm. I think there's, we have a fair rationale for it, but um, it jumps even a step further than the ECOG study. And, um, 
you know, my gut feeling is that both arms are going to do very, very well. And, you know, seeing Dr. Yam's HN2 results, we, we already know how the RT arm is going to do. And this is an even earlier stage population. It's just T1, T2. There's no T3s as there could be in HN2. So we know the RT arm is going to do outstanding. Um, you're, you're assuming our red arms are as good as theirs, but that's, well, that's, a, that's proven. A, For sure not, but... Uh, <laughs> to, to <laughs> We have one last question here before we wrap up. Um, if, if you guys could give a brief answer, I think Lewis Gary chimed in and was one of the first ones here with a question on the chat. Um, are you there? Uh, yes, thank you um, for the, the excellent presentation and discussion. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts about the results of ECOG 3311 and uh, what dose post operatively post-operatively you're comfortable using uh, the surgeon at my institution. I've been pushing for me to use a lower dose, but I'm a little hesitant about long-term outcomes. Yeah, you know, right, so, do you go first, Tony? Go yeah, no, so it is yeah. a phase two study, right? So the, it will ultimately have the answer sometime in like 2026 from the patho study in Europe, right? So um, if you're not familiar, right, that study um, is looking at both intermediate and higher risk, and basically they're randomizing the exact intermediate group from ECOG 3311 to 50 versus 60 gray, and then the high risk group with positive margins or extra capture spread is 60 gray RT versus 60 gray with chemo. And that their sample size for that study is 1100. They are actually accruing incredibly well until COVID, um, but they're projected to finish like 2026. So that'll be definitive. And so I think it's controversial whether you change practice based on um, based on a phase two study. But my gut my gut instinct is that these this patient group did very well. And again, the, the Mayo group uh, published a pretty large series with um, uh, with thirty six gray adjuvantly, and that the survival was still outstanding in that group. So um, I feel like it's probably gonna probably gonna be equivalent. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. The good, the good thing about Anthony, he actually can answer all the radiation questions. But like he knows the literature. I'm always worried that I can't keep up with him in the radiation oncology literature. Um, and I, I don't do as well in the TORS literature uh, to, to, to sort of represent as well. But I, I think it's a fair question. You know, Do phase two trials change practice? It's something that we talk about in other contexts quite a bit. My, my main thing, so our own practice, again, because we're not doing TORS off study, these people are all on orator two in which they're getting 50 gray. My hunch is that it's probably fine. You know, if you look at Dr. Yom's uh, trial, they were getting 60 gray, surgery plus 50, probably similar effect, similar cyto reduction. The one thing that's missing from E3311 that I haven't seen, and Anthony, if you've seen them, you can correct me, is we haven't seen the swallowing scores. Is that Have you seen them, Tony? I haven't seen them. No. So to what extent are we getting a benefit from going down from 60 to 50? I'm not exactly sure. I don't think 10 gray is going to make a big difference in these patients' outcome, but I think you can make a reasonable decision to give to give either. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us, and thank you so much to Dr. Nichols and Dr. Palma. Um, I, I guess one of the things that I think is so cool about this is that we can have so many experts kind of weighing in in one virtual conversation here. So um, it's a, a privilege to, to be able to um, hear from all of you tonight. So um, thank you, everyone, and, and we hope to see you again. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Kaylee. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, well.